If you like a good movie and love a tasty treat, you could win one of three HD flat screen TVs. This is your chance to snack, watch, and win. Buy a three pack of Act Two popcorn or a 10 ounce Crunch and Munch, plus a Hershey's milk chocolate or cookies and cream bar. Write your name and number on the back of the receipt. Drop it off at Pritchard's, Robinson Road, or Caleb Bahamas Marathon Mall. Then order a movie from Rev TV On Demand, Channel 500, for your chance to snack, watch, and win. Enter today. Promotion ends August 30th. Good evening, everyone. You're tuned into MB12. Coming up tonight in news, how a Bahamian man wearing an ankle bracelet ended up in Canada. A 22-year-old man charged with a toddler's murder, this as an American arraigned on rape charges. Political squabbling over Cuban detainees continues, plus what some students think of disappointing national exam results. I'm Bonnie Toot, and NB12 starts now. Tonight, weeks after a man wearing an ankle bracelet was found dead, there appears to be more controversy surrounding the electronic monitoring system used to keep track of suspected criminals out on bail. This as a man wearing an ankle bracelet was allowed to travel outside the country. It follows Minister of National Security Dr. Bernard Nottage detailing the kind of intense review the system is under. Christina McNeil has more in this report. government is reviewing the electronic monitoring system in order to fine-tune the system that tracks suspected offenders. Dr. Bernard Nottage telling members of the media that as more information emerges about cases currently under investigation, the more urgent the need is to review the current system. ICS President and CEO Stephen Greenslade was not able to appear on camera today. However, he issued a statement to clear up reports that an individual who was being monitored made it to Canada without anyone's knowledge. Greenslade says the offender claimed to have received permission to leave the country from a magistrate on Harbour Island. He says that permission was confirmed by the officer in charge on the island. Greenslade notes that there was no breach committed by the offender in his travel to Canada as his bail condition did not restrict his ability to travel. And while the individual is abroad, Greenslade says he is being tracked and is in full communication with the command center. However, earlier this week, National Security Minister Dr. Bernard Nottage told members of the press that based on recent events, his ministry is reviewing the system and its management. We um, clearly uh, have not been completely satisfied with the, with the system that currently exists. And so we will be looking for ways to improve that um, during the course of the next several months. Dr. Nottage was unable to speak specifically to the $2.7 million contract with ICS Security. That contract was signed in 2010 and expires in November. However, State Minister of National Security Keith Bell and Prime Minister Perry Christie have suggested that government may have to find a new company to monitor the people wearing ankle bracelets. According to ICS President and CEO Stephen Greenslade, five people have been killed while being monitored since the program program's inception. 33-year-old Anthony Roll Fox was discovered dead off a dirt road near the South Beach Canal in late July. Police said it appeared Roll was dead for at least a week before his body was discovered. Yesterday, Nottage said he was not able to comment on that investigation. As far as investigation in the individual cases, um, they are ongoing. Uh, I don't know the specific case to which you are referring, but um, each time that there is a crime committed by someone who has an ankle bracelet and it comes to our attention, or one of these persons uh, goes missing off the, off the screen, um, some very interesting things are being revealed to us which uh, point us into, in the direction in which we need to go in order to improve uh, uh, on the system that we, that we currently have. Meanwhile, police are upping efforts to detect and deter 
of potential criminals and criminal activity. The National Security Ministry has confirmed that 243 cameras have been installed at criminal hotspots in the first phase of the National Closed Circuit Television Project. I'm hopeful, I'm hopeful that uh, by the end of this month, or certainly by the end of September, that we will have had a full launch of the system. And we expect that to contribute significantly um, to a crime-fighting armamentarium. Nodded says this round of cameras has been installed at a cost of $5 million. Government has contracted the Bahamas Telecommunications Company to complete the installation of the multi-million dollar network. Reporting for NB12, I'm Christina McNeil. Despite homicide detectives' best efforts, authorities say at least 15 alleged killers are still on the loose. Most of those suspects are either in their teens or 20s. One of those murder investigations is seven years old and the trail has gone cold. That's why authorities have enlisted the help of some of the victim's grieving relatives, who say they're finding it difficult to get closure while their loved one's killers may continue to walk among us. This has been a difficult and trying time for us. Uh, Abby is my last child. Uh, he was only 23 at the time. On the night of October 3rd, 2012, Alvin Sargent got the news that every parent dreads. His son, Albiani Stewart, was shot and killed near Roots Jalkanoo practice on Christie Park. Police said at the time they believed the gunman and two others were attempting to steal his car. The shooter was never captured. Now, nearly one year later, his father is still struggling to find closure. But we've been relying on the grace of God because without God, Nothing is possible. Without, with him, everything is possible. We don't know who our son killer was before now, but we are happy that there is a silver lining on the horizon. Bruce Colbrook of Dumping Ground Corner is wanted for Sergeant's murder. The victim's father says the family won't rest until he's behind bars. Giovanni Bain says he shares Sergeant's pain. His brother, Gregory Bain Jr., was killed in Abaco on August 26, 2012, leaving behind a young daughter and a baby on the way. He was a good father. The last one he never even got to see because the incident happened while the lady was pregnant. In matters like this, <clears throat> We just want some kind of justice to be served. The suspect in Bain's murder, Louis Cadet of Abaco, is still on the loose. Police are also searching for Kelly Mitchell, who is wanted for the January 2008 murder of Peter Andrew Colley. Then there's Leo Bethel, who remains at large following the high-profile murder of American Kyle Bruner back in April 2013. We have charged um, three persons previously with that particular murder, but Leo is still on the run from us. Head of the Central Detective Unit, Superintendent Paul Roll says police would also like to question these murder suspects. Ramil Gray, Shamiko Rigby, Jermaine Scott, Cornelius Roberts, Gibson Baptiste, Lavado Poitier, Kevin Roll, Jamal Wallace, Shalvin Laramore, Andre Thompson, and William Etienne. Though homicide detectives' leads have dried up, Rolls says police will not let up until all of these men are behind bars. I'm certain that these people have to eat, they have to sleep, and persons know where they are. And if we find persons are harboring these, now that I have made it, made this appeal, and if we find that these persons, you're harboring them, you will be uh, dealt with. You see, and we're not going to rest. We're not going to rest until we, we find them. We want to assure the members of the, of the Bahamas community, we want to ensure family members, grieving family members, that we have not forgotten. From the courts, a 22-year-old man has been charged with the murder of 2-year-old Tion Morley, who was found dead in his home last Friday. Trevor Carey appeared before Acting Chief Magistrate Joanne Ferguson Pratt. According to initial police reports, Carey was watching over the toddler and his 5-year-old brother at an apartment on Allen Drive. Carey is said to be known by the boy's mother. 
Preliminary reports indicate Morley was allegedly punished with a beating sometime after he had eaten. Morley reportedly went to his bedroom to lie down and a short while later, he was beaten a second time. In both incidents, it's alleged that a frying pan was used in those beatings. Police originally gave a different age for the suspect when the boy's body was discovered. Carey, who was not represented by an attorney, was not required to enter a plea to the charge. Prosecution plans to proceed by way of voluntary bill of indictment. Carey will return to court on November 18th. He has been remanded to Her Majesty's prison. In other court news, an American visitor accused of rape will have an extended stay in the Bahamas as he was denied bail in a magistrate's court. 26-year-old Ryan Doherty of Yonkers, New York, is charged with raping a 20-year-old visitor at Paradise Island on August 19th. Now, Doherty was not required to enter a plea to the charge. Prosecutor Clifford Daxon objected to bail, telling the court that Doherty has no status in the Bahamas and no ties to the country. Doherty is employed as a network engineer in New York. His attorney, Kimberly Evans, asked acting Chief Magistrate Joanne Ferguson Pratt to consider granting bail, as Doherty has no prior offenses in the United States or the Bahamas. Evans says Doherty was expected to return to work today. Five hours after his arraignment got underway, though, Magistrate Ferguson Pratt told the court that after extensive examination, she was unable to grant bail due to amendments to the Bail Act in 2011. Ferguson Pratt said her hands are tied in the matter and she is bound by the law. At that point, Doherty held his head in his hands and exhaled loudly. He was remanded to Her Majesty's prison until November 8th when he will return to court. A five-member jury heard closing arguments in the Jamie Smith Coroner's inquest today. Wayne Monroe, who represents four officers with an interest in the case, argued that the officers rightfully used force to restrain Smith, while the attorney for Smith's family, Christina Galanos, argued he was unlawfully killed by police. Jasmine Bonamy has the latest. After weeks of testimony from nearly a dozen witnesses who took the stand, closing arguments were heard in the coroner's inquest into the custody death of Jamie Smith. Smith died at the Central Detective Unit within hours of his arrest on suspicion of armed robbery on February 8th. Inspector Ezra Maycock, Sergeant Keno Smith, and Corporals Sterling Knowles and Brian Roach claimed that the deceased became violent and tried to escape after confessing to participating in the armed robberies of Island Game and Titan Web Shop. Roach, seen here wearing the brown suit, said he used a chokehold that was not taught at the police training college to restrain Smith, who gave police police the false name of Matthew Jacob Pratt on arrest. Pathologist Dr. Karen Sands said Smith died from asphyxia or a lack of oxygen. Leading off closing arguments this morning was Galanos, who led off insisting Smith was a healthy young man when he entered police custody and officers had a responsibility to protect him. Galanos added that Smith was not being questioned for a capital offense that would have called for the death penalty. She further insisted the officers should not have acted as judge, jury and executioner, as Smith died an innocent man. Galanos also called Roach a forthcoming witness for admitting he placed Smith in a sleeper hold to subdue him, but said she could not understand why he would do so without being CPR certified. But Monroe insisted Smith was a deviant and unarmed robbery suspect who lied to police about his identity. Monroe added that the cause of death was not in dispute, conceding his client had placed Smith in a chokehold. But he went on to say that it was his personal view that Smith should have died from a close-range shot to the heart, as the situation could have got out of control if Smith grabbed one of the officer's gun during the alleged struggle. Monroe added that instead his clients used the sleeper hold, a technique used by police across the world and considered to be non-fatal to subdue Smith. He said his clients had no intention of killing Smith. Monroe told the jurors that when making their decision to put themselves in the officer's shoes in the moments leading up to Smith's death, insisting it was a serious situation. Summing up his arguments, Monroe told the jury that sometimes bad people doing bad things have bad things happen to them. The case is expected to continue on September 5th when Coroner Janine Weish Gomez will instruct the jury. Reporting for NB12, I'm Jasmine Bonamy.